All right, good morning, everyone, and, and thank you for being here um, uh, for this briefing uh, on the housing and homelessness in the state. Uh, before I, I begin, uh, you know, getting into the details of the work that that uh, Secretary Pryor and has uh, been leading the charge on, I want to really make a real strong statement here um, about the Jewish community here in Rhode Island and around the world uh, on that Sabbath uh, weekend and time frame. Let's take a moment to speak really directly about the horrific situation we've seen unfolding in Israel and threats uh, that have been made in the United States. Make no mistake, there will be zero tolerance for any violence or threats of violence here in Rhode Island, period. We've spoken with Colonel Weaver and the state police, and they are on alert and ready to support local law enforcement in cities and towns across our state. I've been in contact with the uh, Alliance, the Jewish Alliance, directly, and they have my, my phone number, and uh, we're, we're ready to respond. Uh, but the most important thing right now, the message is, let's prevent any, any acts of um, anti-Semitism in any capacity. So at this time, there are no credible threats in Rhode Island, but we are vigilant and we must all remain vigilant. Our state was founded on the basis of religious freedom. And just as I want my family and all families in the state of Rhode Island to have that opportunity to worship without fear, our Jewish neighbors deserve and, and entitled to that same right. Okay. Well, thank you all for allowing me to take a, make that statement, and uh, thank you again uh, for being here uh, to talk about the subject at hand. Our team, led by Housing Secretary Pryor, has been working tirelessly to develop a winter strategy that focuses on expansion, prevention, and collaboration. But more importantly, a strategy that keeps Rhode Islanders warm and safe uh, during this winter. In a moment, uh, Secretary Pryor will go through the details of the strategy which he's been sharing with me over the last several months. But I wanted to emphasize that we've, we're taking an all-hands-on-deck approach to providing solutions, preventing and addressing homelessness in Rhode Island. You can see that the approach with some of the individuals here today. I want to thank our state agencies like EM Director Mark Pappas, as well as EOHHS team who have worked uh, on this effort uh, with the Secretary Pryor and his office. I want to thank our state agencies like EMA and Director Pappas, uh, you know, to, for their continued work, uh, uh, not only in, in the past and last year, but also, you know, really digging in and, and making sure that good things are going to happen. I also want to thank our faith leaders uh, from across our denominations uh, and, uh, who have come together to support this effort. And it is an all in effort. Um, we're certainly going to do our best as a state, uh, but it needs to be uh, wider than that. The scope of the work needs to be wider than that. And we're asking others to do their best. And so I want to thank our clergy that is here and, and, and those who represent uh, our faith leaders who are really stepping up in a real strong way. I also want to thank our General Assembly uh, with the Speaker and the Senate President in supporting our budget that has allowed us to have resources uh, to address this issue as well. And also, of course, our municipal leaders uh, who have answered our call to help identify locations for potential shelter sites. And finally, I want to thank the providers, those providers who are out there doing the work and we'll work with anyone who's willing to do the work. And going into this w winter feels different than winters past. Uh, I think that uh, having a housing office uh, was um, uh, something that has been very helpful to us uh, in, in establishing that office 
uh, with leadership uh, that is working on not only this issue, but on a broader base issue of housing in the state of Rhode Island, which we continue to work on at the same time. Yes, the same sir. Time? We sure do. Yes. Uh, so this winter, we're going to be trying new ideas like municipal pop-up hubs for the coldest days of the year and um, piloting pallet shelters. So there's no perfect solution to this, otherwise this would be done. If it was easy, it would be done in a way that addresses every, every issue. Again, we're going to do our best, and we're asking others to do their best. Now, this is important. Uh, you know, this is a work in progress. Today's announcement isn't the end of our work for the winter. Stefan will tell you that as of today, we'll have 30% more beds available for shelter this January compared to last January, but we're not stopping there. And uh, Stefan has been, and his team has been hard at work even up to this moment before we get into, we, we are here today on this press, press conference to con continue to add uh, options to the mix. In coming weeks, there will be more details and announcements, and we continue to expand our capacity to meet the needs of Rhode Islanders. So I'll close by, again, a broad thank you for the hard work that's going on. Uh, and uh, again, we'll ask everyone to do their best uh, to do the work and making sure that we are doing everything we can uh, to um, address this very important issue. And I'll uh, ask uh, Stephan to fill in the blanks. Thank you very, very much, Governor. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all for being here. I'm Stephan Pryor. I serve as the Governor's Secretary of Housing. Uh, we are here to talk about the winter strategy that has been in formulation for months uh, and that we are setting forth today. Um, I emphasize that it's been coming together for months because uh, when Governor McKee and we uh, announced that we would be stepping forward uh, as a new housing department, Assistant Secretary Moore and I said that we, we knew winter was coming, we would start planning. It's been eight months. What I'm going to describe to you is an expand, prevent, collaborate strategy that has had groundwork over that month. And I'll explain both in terms of actions taken and in terms of statistics that can shed light. So let me say these things. Um, First of all, profound thank you to Governor McKee for providing the resources and the leadership. Um, it's an understatement to say we couldn't do it without you. I do have to reiterate the thanks to the General Assembly leadership, including Speaker Shikarshi uh, and Senate President Ruggiero, uh, and to the many stakeholders, service providers in the field who get the work done, and property owners, houses of worship, municipal leaders who are stepping up and stepping up and stepping up yet again. Um, it's why this is all working. Okay. Uh, expand, prevent, and collaborate. So um, we should have a slide that displays this. We do. Um, I'll speak to the central plank. Expand. We are going to explain how we're going to achieve a 30% increase on the winter bed strength of last winter with the investments that we're making and explaining today. There's more to come. Prevention. It's so essential that we aim to help our fellow Rhode Islanders who are at risk of homelessness or experiencing homelessness to avoid shelter if they don't wish it, or to stay in their homes if we can allow it and we can enable it. Collaborate, it's the partnerships that we've described and we're gonna get into depth on those. Okay, let's get right into the shelter points. We know this is important, but we wanted to envelop these points in the broader strategy so that you would understand that it isn't simply about shelter, but of course, expanding shelter opportunities is very, very important. All right, so I want to, I hope that you all can hear me. I will restate things over a microphone, but I'm going to step up here for a moment.
workable enough. I just want to show, I want to show this. In this chart, in October of 2022, we were at 789 deaths. We project that we'll be at 1370 going into this winter, in the course of this winter, the winter, if you will, of 2024, okay? I also want to describe some things that have happened here. This is key to understanding how this work has been occurring for eight months, and even before, this groundwork is so essential to the bed strength that we're describing today. Here's what I mean. Under Governor McKee, last winter, there were sev several installations and operations that were started up. One of them was the Cranston Street Armory. In the winter, the number of beds in the roster was 150 at that armory. There was an increase in beds. We're accounting for both shelter beds and warming center beds, if you will, inclusive of that armory operation. There was an increase in beds across these categories, shelter and center. When the armory was de-operationalized, it was ramped down, we expressed, many of the reporters in the room were witness to this, many of the service providers and partners, you made this happen, that we would ramp up other beds. We did, in different locations. Woonsocket and Warwick and Providence, you, many of you know the list. Those were stood up. We therefore maintained strength in our roster of beds so that as the winter arrives and we add to this portfolio, we are truly increasing the number of beds available to Rhode Islanders experiencing homelessness. That was so important. This effort has been underway for months. I want to just illustrate that for you. This point, by the way, we believe to be a reasonably conservative estimate. There is more to come. I'm going to get into that. Okay, back to the table. I know everyone is looking for an extraordinarily geeky presentation, so I will return to the table and continue the explanation. Okay. Just very quickly here, as to the move from 789 up, um, I want to say this. Um, we did not see significant declines over the summer, as we often do. We extended warming centers in almost all cases, the Cranston Street Armory being an exception. Here we are in October with the current shelter and warming center bed count at 1,156. That's the current count. This is actually 104 more than we had in January of last year when the Cranston Street Armory was serving the 150 clients I was describing. With the following shelter opportunities, I'm going to delineate them, we can share with you that our capacity will be stronger than last winter's by 318 beds, reflecting a 30% increase compared to last January. Okay, so now I'm going to describe those different maneuvers, those different investments, those different programs. I see Rich Delfino is here from Tri-County Community Action. Thank you very much, Rich. Tri-County is, as we speak, accepting its first families into three state-owned cottages at the Zamborano campus in Burrowville. As a matter of fact, Rich, yesterday. mom and a two-year-old were invited in yesterday. So thank you for that. Um, Harvest Community Church in Woonsocket is going to provide 22 beds for adults. Monsignor Kenny, thank you profoundly. There's going to be um, more than one item of news from the Roman Catholic Diocese of Providence today. But I will uh, express this one to start. The Diocese of Providence has renovated the second floor of Emanuel House 
and they are in the process of adding 41 new beds, which will be available for adults. Jim Jans is here. Thank you for that terrific work. That's been underway for months, by the way. Another example. This did not happen overnight. Um, and there's more in store from the Diocese of Providence. The Amos House operation at Charles Gate is expanding to include 48 additional beds once an additional floor is renovated. That's expected in the new year. I'm pleased to report that the Department of Housing has reached a preliminary agreement with the property owner at Charles Gate in order to acquire the property. <laughs> Governor McKee has justifiably and correctly emphasized with his housing department that where we can acquire a property and achieve cost savings over the longer term, we should. This is the first but not the last example. In multiple instances as we do this under the governor's program, we'll seek to convert emergency shelter as we grow the overall system of shelter and housing into permanent housing. Okay, more to say on that in the future. Going forward with this list to explain the 13, 318 beds. Westerly area rest meals, otherwise known as warm rust, bless you, Russ Partridge, will be providing a seasonal motel sheltering program in Washington County to provide an additional 24 beds. Thank you, Russ. The governor and we so much appreciate your partnership. Finally, there's been interest expressed by key service providers, by individuals experiencing homelessness, uh, and by many stakeholders in the notion of temporary structures in order to help remedy homelessness. We have been investigating such possibilities, multiple types of temporary structures. Governor McKee likewise has emphasized that we are to be creative, innovation is valued, and that semi-permanent, temporary, and interim structures may be part of the mix. We are pleased to say to you today that we are working both with the city of Pawtucket and the city of Providence on the possibility of an installation involving pallet shelters in one of those two locations for 30 to 45 pallets, each of them having the capacity to house an individual experiencing homelessness. 30 to 45 pallet shelters in one of those two locations. Dialogue with the property owners continues, uh, and we will have more to say on that in the coming weeks. House of Hope is a key potential partner and has been a spearhead of this effort. We are very grateful to House of Hope so add it all up and we have 210 new beds on top of 108 expansion beds that have occurred throughout this year. And that brings us to 318 beds over last winter, a 30% increase in our shelter and warming center system. Okay. Now, we're not done yet. We know that um, it can be challenging to predict with precision how many Rhode Islanders will be experiencing homelessness in the course of the winter. This is true in every state, in every jurisdiction. We know that we need to continue to enter potential properties into the pipeline. So that's what we're doing. I'm gonna step up here again for a moment. carrying some of this material with me, apparently. Okay. Next one, please. Okay. So, 
Um, what I want to say here is that we are exploring a variety of properties and conducting a dialogue with service providers capable of carrying out the professional operations necessary for high quality operation. We're talking to cities and towns, including Central Falls, Coventry, Cumberland, East Providence, Kingston, Providence, and Woonsocket. The dialogue often includes the mayor or town manager is sometimes initiated by the mayor or town manager. I want to thank the League of Cities and Towns for being a great partner. I want to acknowledge Dylan Zalazo from Pawtucket. Um, mayor Grebian has been a very collaborative partner. Mayor Mutter in Cumberland, a very collaborative partner. Mayor De Silva in East Providence, a very collaborative partner, and it goes on from there. What are we looking at? We're looking at church properties, vacant schools, empty retail locations, vacant state-owned property, because the governor has issued multiple requests and it's working to his cabinet. Municipally owned vacant community centers, unused former healthcare facilities. All of these are far enough along in our evaluation that we are expressing them out loud. In these various scenarios, uh, we are speaking with and working on arrangements with municipal officials, community partners, and often private parties expressing lease or acquisition terms. So we can't get into every detail today, but there is a process where that is occurring and simultaneously we are inviting and enabling and making matches with service providers. I want to talk about a couple of these in greater detail today. Just bear with me for one moment as I do so. Narragansett Park Plaza in East Providence is a partially vacant retail complex in a segment of the vacated space at Narragansett Park Plaza, which is a private, privately owned retail complex in East Providence near the Pawtucket border. We are in the process of negotiating the establishment of a temporary warming center that would be operated 24 hours a day, that would include supports and services, um, and that could serve up to 100 Rhode Islanders experiencing homelessness in up to 100 beds. Narragansett Park Plaza in East Providence. That's an illustration for you for today, is that a fully orchestrated arrangement, it is not. Uh, we continue dialogue with Mayor De Silva, with council members in East Providence, with the property owner, and with other community stakeholders. More to be said about that going forward. In addition, we're very pleased that Monsignor Kenny will be able to offer us an update on the extraordinary efforts under the Monsignor of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Providence. So that's, those are some illustrations for today. Would you uh, please do the next? Thank you. Winter emergencies. We've said this a couple times. I want to thank Director Mark Pappas from the start. Uh, one of the things that Director Pappas and we have been dialoguing about for months is the fact that, to their credit, cities and towns across Rhode Island operate centers such as libraries and fire stations that are open for Rhode Island homeowners who may lose their heat or power, or for Rhode Islanders who are in the more traditional definition experiencing homelessness. 
One of the challenges is, and this is understandable, that in the absence of state resources and in the absence of true partnership with the state, it has been hard in some cases to go beyond the operations of, say, the operating hours of, say, a library that closes at 4 p.m. or 7 p.m. and the coldest hours and the most critical hours can be in the later hours of the evening. With RAIMA, the Emergency Management Agency under Governor McKee, working with the director, we are going to make small grants available to municipalities to open their existing centers for longer or, or to open altogether new centers. The grants could be on the order of magnitude of $50,000 or $75,000 for staffing or supplies or other resources necessary. We are grateful to the cities and towns that are already stepping up, considering the possibility. We're grateful to the Episcopal Diocese and Bishop Nicholas Nisley for already working with possibilities within the bishop's constellation of Episcopal churches. All of these things are preliminary. We're in the process of dialoguing. Next week, the housing department will issue a solicitation to cities and towns, an invitation to them, so that they can apply for these funds. There's an information session, it's already heavily subscribed for municipal leaders tomorrow for this purpose. These centers, we call them emergency hubs. These hubs will be available at, for example, a trigger temperature. It's a process that with Director Pappas we will discuss further with municipal leaders and work out the precise criteria, but illustratively, when it gets below 20 degrees, they would open. That is not a hard and fast rule, it's not a determination, but Director Pappas has actually researched other examples of this in the country, and that's an illustration of how it will happen. So during severe cold or a storm, these will open. Okay, next please. I know we're far along on the agenda, we have more to go, I'm gonna move quickly, but this is very important. It's essential that we aim to prevent homelessness so it doesn't happen at all. It's a cost-effectiveness mat uh, mat matter. It will enable us to keep costs down. And it's the right thing to do because Rhode Islanders often want to stay in the homes where they live. So, what does this mean? We are working on eviction prevention through a $3 million investment in Rhode Island Legal Services and allied legal services organizations to prevent unjustified um, and unnecessary evictions through the court system. We are also investing in what's called problem solving, problem solving programming. I want to thank Karen Santilli and Crossroads for helping to lead the way among agencies. Crossroads has really work to figure out how to problem solve. What does problem solving mean? Problem solving means that an individual may be modestly in arrears on her or his rent, and that may save them from being evicted while they are in the process of accepting a new job where they'll have the sufficient income. Homelessness never occurs. It might be that an, an item of dress clothing or a pair of shoes would help with that job interview. It might be that transportation to a relative or friend would get someone into housing that is not a shelter, but a family or friend location. You get the idea. We're investing from the housing department $750,000 for the purpose of the problem solving where there's flexible money necessary to do the things that I've described, and we have a million dollars additional in our budget to be deployed for counseling services and other supports to make this all work. So this will be done in, in collaboration with other agencies and we'll talk more about that. Next. So we come to this point. We are very proud of the fact that in Rhode Island, we have a faith community that is unified around the issue of remedying preventing and addressing homelessness. We are so proud of the fact that we have faith communities represented today, inclusive of the Catholic Diocese, the Episcopal Diocese, 
the rabbinate within the Jewish community uh, and uh, Islamic leadership, uh, imams in our community, all allied with us today. Pastor Chris, thank you for helping to orchestrate this with us. Enormously appreciated. Uh, I'm gonna say more about that uh, and offer some more recognition, but I do want to, at this moment, segue to Monsignor Kenny, uh, because uh, we are so proud that this faith community effort has materialized, and I want to let, of course, the Monsignor speak of it. Uh, but I think especially at this moment in time, as the governor has highlighted at the top of his remarks, especially at this moment in time, Rhode Islanders should be proud that our faith leaders, our clergy, are coming together for a collaborative cause in our shared mission to help the most vulnerable. It is really exemplary. Uh, the Reverend Monsignor Albert Kenny of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Providence is the Vicar General and Moderator of the Curia for our Bishop. He's an absolutely fantastic partner, and to you, Monsignor. Thank you, Secretary Pryor. As one of the many faith leaders here, certainly we remember that this is the first night of the Sabbath since the violence broke out in the state of Israel. So we are united in prayer with our Jewish friends during these most difficult days. Shabbat Shalom. Governor, we thank you. We thank you for your leadership in calling us together to address the need to comfort and house our brothers and sisters here in Rhode Island. Secretary Pryor, we remain grateful to you for your dedicated leadership. I think I have had more coffee meetings with Stefan than my own staff in the last couple of months. <laughs> Bringing together faith communities, he has a unique ability to gather us together, all the faith traditions throughout Rhode Island, with our common cry to shelter and feed the poor, to bring peace to those in need and to love our neighbor as ourselves. For myself, in a very deep and personal way, this issue strikes at the very heart of faith and my belief that we see the face of Christ in those who are in distress. The Roman Catholic Diocese of Providence and Bishop Henning remain committed to increasing our efforts to assist the unhoused and unsheltered in our beloved state as we increase our services at Emmanuel House and we are now finalizing additional beds in different uh, cities and towns as we work with local leadership to address this cause. We certainly remain blessed by the presence of so many faith leaders here. Many of us recently gathered to discuss and discern the most appropriate ways that communities might address the needs of people living without stable or permanent shelter. Today, as faith leaders, we stand as one, dedicated to the common call that runs through all our faith traditions to give aid to those who are most in need, to provide for those who are seeking shelter, and to work towards the goal of giving to those who are seeking what we all truly wish, a home. May God bless our efforts. Amen. Monsignor, thank you very, very much. Uh, so beautifully expressed. Um, I want to introduce uh, other clergy who are present, and then Monsignor, uh, may we speak of one additional uh, diocese investment? Okay, wonderful. Uh, so, um, first of all, I want to recognize Bishop Nicholas Nisley of the Episcopal Diocese, Imam Abdul Latif Sakur of the Islamic Center of Rhode Island, Imam Mufti Ikram Haq of Masjid Al Islam, and Rabbi Sarah Mack of Temple Beth El. This has been a true collaboration, and together, under the leadership of these clergy and Pastor Chris, uh, 
we have heard your call and we will be working with houses of worship across denominations and across Rhode Island to see whether individual houses of worship or even uh, collectively across uh, such churches, synagogues, and mosques, we can do yet more. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Monsignor Kenny, uh, may I have your permission to speak of the Holy Family Vestry in Woonsocket? Absolutely. Um, because of our collaboration, uh, the Monsignor, uh, on behalf of the Bishop and the Diocese, has identified possible uh, locations for expansion of his operations. Uh, one of them is the Holy Family Vestry of up to 15 new beds in Woonsocket. Uh, and we're thankful to Jim Jams for that possibility. Um, it's, it's truly extraordinary on top of the Emanuel House expansion. And what I want to remind you all of is when I spoke of 318 beds and up by 30%, it did not include up to 100 beds in East Providence at the vacant retail site. It did not include 15 beds in Woonsocket at the Holy Family Vestry. That 115 beds would be on top of that. So you can see how we are on track with, that, with these materializing options and others to go yet further. Uh, we are so pleased that the Executive Director of the Warm Center in Westerly, Russ Partridge, is here with us. Uh, and as a final set of comments before we take questions, we want to open it up to Russ with our gratitude. Good morning. Uh, my name is Russ Partridge, and I am honored to be the Executive Director of the Warm Center in Westerly and the Warm Welcome House in Peacedale. And yes, I did make the trip all the way up here this morning. <laughs> Um, but I want to thank uh, the Governor and the Secretary for the opportunity to speak at this event this morning. The funding that's coming to Warm and to Washington County will indeed be a game changer uh, for the people that we serve. It will give us, as the providers, the opportunity to move people from the street and from places not meant for human ha habitation into a safe environment and giving them the opportunity to have a base to work off of with case management, with people who will provide uh, resources that they may need in the, in the hopes that folks will move forward. It really will be in Washington County and throughout the state. This money will be a game changer. But it's not the answer, and the governor knows that, and the secretary knows that. The answer to homelessness is housing. That's the bottom line. The answer to homelessness is housing. I have been in this business uh, working strictly with homeless for about 25 years. Um, I began in this business when we had a 10-year plan to end homelessness. And we haven't come all that far but I am incredibly encouraged over the last 24, 18 to 24 months. I have heard the words affordable housing come out of the governor's office mm -hmm. more often than I have heard it in the 25 years that I have been doing homeless work. And for that, um, secretary and governor, from the people that we serve, I thank you. It has been a difference. This homelessness is not an easy problem to solve. We have been behind the eight ball for years. We have not developed affordable housing the way that we needed to, and it has come back. Um, the chickens have come home to roost, so to speak. But again, I am very encouraged because down in Washington County, I know of three projects that are in the pipeline, more than in the pipeline, they're ready to break ground on, that will mean an additional more than 175 units of permanent housing. That's what we need. We need permanent housing for folks. So when I see that and speak with the leaders, the civic leaders down in Washington County, I really get the sense we are all beginning to come on the same page. We are beginning to row in the same direction. Haven't seen that uh, in a great deal of time. 
The Secretary talked about prevention. That's really a, a, a huge piece of addressing the problem of homelessness here in Rhode Island. If we can prevent people from coming into the system, we have a better shot of, of reducing the numbers of homeless people and keeping people and families and individuals in the community in which they live. It is incredibly important for people to be successful, to be in the community where their resources are. It's just common sense. I want to thank the governor once again. I want to thank the secretary of housing once again. I want to thank the speaker of the house. How often, it's not had been very often in 25 years that I have seen the speaker stand up and really push and give momentum to solving the homeless problem here in the state of Rhode Island. You know, about a little over a year ago, I met in this room with a group of providers and the governor, and I said to the governor at that point, um, that this was really an opportunity for his administration to make a mark for Rhode Island. That we really, and I still believe this, I'm a dinosaur in this business now, I really do believe that Rhode Island can be the state that can say, we have ended functional homelessness. And I believe that that is possible. And again, I thank you for your leadership on this, Governor. This funding is, will be used to keep our family, our friends, our neighbors safe in the upcoming winter. That's really what this funding is about. And it shouldn't be taken as anything more than that, this funding. But we know through conversations that have been had with municipalities and with the secretary and with the governor, this is just, I really believe it's just the beginning. I think we are on a path where we are rowing in the same direction, where we are collaborating with each other as providers. We are collaborating with each other in the municipalities. I go into meetings with municipalities five years ago, six years ago. They wouldn't want to have this conversation about affordable housing. They are inviting the conversation now. That's a really important shift that people should know that we are beginning to make a difference. As difficult as things are for those experiencing homelessness, again, I am encouraged that I do think that we are at the beginning and that there is a light at the end of the tunnel that is not the oncoming train. I think we are looking at things to resolve this issue. Again, I, I want to thank the governor. I want to thank the secretary. I want to thank Hannah. I want to thank my fellow providers. We do, we do the work, but we have an amazing group of people. We have amazing staffs who really are on the ground every day. And on behalf of those people, on behalf of my board at the Warm Center, on behalf of my fellow providers, but more importantly, government, secretary, on behalf of the people that we serve, I thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you all for all you do, Russ, and to, once again, uh, our service providers. Thank you for the remarkable work that you do. Some very quick thank yous, but they're important, and we're right into Q&A. Uh, one thank you is also a, an, uh, an item of information that's really important. When I spoke of the problem-solving mission and programming, I spoke of the investments of the state. I want to add that uh, Chris Bazzacco is here from the Rhode Island Foundation on behalf of uh, former Congressman David Cicilline. We're very grateful that the Rhode Island Foundation will be providing a way for Rhode Islanders uh, to give small amounts or uh, for institutions to even give grants to supplement, to be alongside the state government investments in problem solving. More details on the establishment of a fund for problem solving 
in order to support Rhode Islanders experiencing homelessness. More details will be issued jointly between the Foundation and we next week, including the precise way in which to donate. But that's aiming for everyday Rhode Islanders to have the opportunity to contribute if they so desire, if they wish. Uh, I do want to thank Assistant Secretary Hannah Moore, Joey Lindstrom, Ben Haney, Kat Perez, Emily Marshall, Chris Hunsinger, from the Governor's Office, Kate Paraglia, for everything that you are doing to make this happen. Jordan Day came in, and she's from the League of Cities and Towns. Thank you for your partnership. Okay, we're opening it up for Q&A. Here we go. Uh, So there are, there are varying estimates of the demand that will exist during the winter, and that's understandable. It, it's the case because conditions are changing nationally, and there are, uh, there are specific changes that occur in most jurisdictions during the winter uh, that affect homelessness. Uh, but what I can say is this. Uh, we will be up in our shelter bed strength by hundreds. We will also be investing further in the kind of problem solving and prevention that does markedly and in a very real way impact homelessness. And for the first time in a way that's meaningful, we will be investing in these true emergency winter hubs where when it's especially cold or there's a storm, Rhode Islanders experiencing homelessness and indeed all Rhode Islanders impacted by such cold weather or storm can go. Given all of that, we are optimistic that we will be able to meet the needs. Now, what's another key reason we're optimistic? It's because of everyone you see here. It's because we know that the spirit of we're not done yet is shared by all of us. We are continuing to work with municipal leaders. Faith leaders themselves are calling upon houses of worship to do more. We're not done yet. I cannot get into that as of yet, but we will be able to speak to financial terms and other terms in the course of our crystallization of the arrangement. So let me just make sure I speak with precision. Um, there is a proposal by Open Doors for up to 49 women with children uh, to utilize uh, facilities in that location. We are requesting of the City of Providence that they uh, secure approvals that they implement necessary approvals to advance that proposal. Our understanding is that the legal requirements for it to advance have been met. For multiple questions, I'm going to tag team with the very able Assistant Secretary Hannah Moore. Um, do you want to express your Numbers for Charles Gate. So currently, we have Amos House at Charles Gate right now, leasing space since this past summer, and they uh, they they have up to fifty seven rooms that they're going to be using. For Charles Gate. And where does Charles stand? For the Charles Gate, uh, we are we have uh, reached preliminary agreement regarding the acquisition. Secretary Fryer, how many beds, incremental beds, open new beds, will be actually online Thanksgiving? Um, Thanksgiving is a very precise point in time, so we are going to see the beds that I've described implemented over time, and in the coming weeks we'll be able to tell you with greater precision where in the calendar they occur. It would be uh, premature for me to say 
right now? It's a good question, but I, I'm not going to uh, offer you that precise estimate today. And just as a follow up, it's now mid October, it's almost Halloween. We've been aware of the situation for a year. Uh, years before that, what's taking so long? Uh, on the contrary, I think we are, as demonstrated in our presentation, we're in the strongest position in memory in terms of the number of beds. We have maintained bed strength through the spring, which it should be noted in the Northeast in four seasons jurisdictions is not common to maintain your traditional shelter and warming center beds all the way through and then to grow them. So in fact, this has been a multi-month effort. It's very planful. Uh, there uh, is a thoughtful and effective strategy underway and we are very pleased with the progress. For your one last question, in a minute you are coming back for new for the program. So, how big of an issue is zoning when it comes to converting churches, when it comes to converting buildings, when it comes to converting help with anything into shelter beds? It varies. Uh, local jurisdictions uh, possess different rules as to zoning and planning and other development and building related permitting. Uh, we uh, are working with our attorneys in tandem with municipal leaders to identify the route to approvals. Sometimes the zoning barriers or the zoning routes can be challenging or can be um, very difficult to work through. Sometimes there are use permits that can be accomplished, that can be secured quickly. So it varies. I will say this though, more generally, the question of identifying new locations for and securing approvals for shelters in service of our unsheltered fellow Rhode Islanders, it's hard work. Understandably, it's a complex subject at the local level. There can be concerns expressed at the local level. There can be bureau bureaucratic pathways that are not straightforward. Navigate, navigating them is part of the process. We're especially pleased that we've been able to make this much progress given all of that. I didn't see Cal, this is officially the last one, and then we have Cal. Uh, Secretary and the Governor, it seems like some of this stuff is both kind of short-term, temporary, and also long-term. So I'm curious about like the expiration date for some of this stuff. like. The emergency winter hubs, like when would those cease to exist, and is the goal to kind of get some of these projects that you presented to us kind of more fine, not fine tuned, but kind of you know, pen to paper or breaking ground? We're actually seeing progress so that there's not a gap essentially. Yes, yes. Uh, first of all, I want to point out, I'm, I'm glad you raised that. Uh, the emergency winter hub numbers are not contained in that 318 figure and not contributing to the 30% increase. It's supplementary to it. Now, having said that, you're absolutely right that those are winter-specific, and that, that, will, that those centers will only operate during the winter. There are other examples where uh, the operations will cease after the winter. There are other examples. Um, it's possible that the East Providence site, for example, will operate for six months. It could go for longer, but it's possible that that one may be truly temporary. So we will, yes, we, the short answer is we will offer updates as these arrangements fully crystallize each and every time, as we did, for example, in Boroughville. Thank you all for coming today. We'll see some of you back at noon. Stephen and Hannah will be here briefly, and I'm going to go to 10.30. And thank you to our team for being here as well. Thank you all very much.